and our security. They have showed it by turning out in the tens of thousands for the milestone anniversaries of the Second World War and by attending Remembrance Day ceremonies in ever-increasing numbers. They showed it with Red Friday rallies in cities across the country and other displays of support for the troops, such as the ubiquitous yellow ribbons. They showed it by demanding that Ottawa show more respect for our brave men and women in uniform by paying them what they deserve, buying them better equipment, looking after them as veterans, and providing them with real liberty. You know, this week we saw evidence federal government lawyers argued in court in January of this year that the government of Canada has no special obligation to Canada's men and women in uniform who volunteer and fight for Canada, and that there exists no social contract between the federal government and military veterans. We found this out on the very same day Prime Minister Harper welcomed the last Canadian troops back from Afghanistan. Now, federal lawyers argued in court in January of this year that the 1917 pledge by then PM Sir Robert Borden that Canada's, quote, first duty, end quote, as to its soldiers who fight, are wounded, or die, was nothing more than a political speech. Federal lawyers were arguing against allowing a class action lawsuit by Afghan war veterans against Ottawa and the federal government's overhaul of veterans' benefits to go forward. All right, so federal lawyers argue in court in January of this year that the federal government has no special obligation to Canada's men and women in uniform who volunteer and fight for Canada regardless of what was said in 1917 by the then Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden just before the Battle of Emmy Ridge, which, if you study Canadian history, you know, was fundamental to the formation of this country, to the definition of what Canada is all about. Um, at the same time the, that we find out that the lawyers are, are saying this, the Prime Minister is welcoming back the last contingent of Canadian soldiers from Afghanistan, then this makes the news. And what happens is Veterans Affairs Minister Julian Fantino argues, and I'm quoting here, some have called the work done by Veterans Affairs to be a duty, a responsibility, a commitment, a social contract, or a sacred obligation. I believe it is all of those things. End of quote. Look, there can't both be simultaneously be and not be a social contract between government and and the men and the women of the military. Most fundamentally, I think most of us would say in this country that we have an obligation to thank those who wear the uniform and who do fight for us and who do suffer. And we've told the stories and we've heard the stories on this program. So I want to get at this this hour on the Roy Green Show on the Corus Radio Network. And joining me is Sergeant Major Barry Westholm, retired. He's been on the show before. You've heard uh, Sergeant Major Barry Westholm resigned from the Canadian Armed Forces in protest of what he identified as chronic mismanagement of the Joint Personnel Support Unit, the JPSU, which was designed to care for members of Canada's military, including those with PTSD. Sergeant Major Barry Westholm also ended his membership in the Conservative Party of Canada over the government's treatment of veterans and soldiers suffering from PTSD and other mental health issues. Barry, it's good to speak with you again. Did I represent what you did accurately? Bang on, Roy. Good to be here. Thank you. Also with me, and he's back, we've spoken to him once before, Bruce Moncor, Afghan campaign veteran. Now, Bruce Moncor lost 5% of his brain after being shot up by a U.S. A-10 troop and tank killer plane. He lost most of the members of his platoon in this so-called friendly fire incident. And Bruce Moncour wrote a widely circulated in media piece titled, Canada, I fought for you and you let me down. He was given the bureaucratic runaround. You have to just get on a search engine. I tweeted this earlier. Get on a search engine and just find Canada, I fought for you and you let me down. Read Bruce Moncour's story. He received from the federal government is by way of financial compensation for the horrendous injuries that he suffered. And he'll talk to us about this. The grand sum of $22,000. Now, if he'd lost an arm or lost a leg, he would have been awarded $250,000. And last year, Bruce Moncour found out that Veterans Affairs had classified his case the same as soldiers suffering from headaches. Hi, Bruce. Hey, how are you doing, sir? I'm I'm well. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for your service to Canada, both of you. Oh, thank you. 
Barry, let me start with you. And guys, if I can just get you to just uh, not breathe too heavily into the phones uh, because it, it does get get on the air pretty strongly. Um, Bruce, federal lawyers argued in court that the government has no special obligation to men and women in uniform and who fight wars for Canada and that the commitment made by Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden in 1917 before the Battle of Emmy Ridge was only a political speech. This is the feds tried to stop a class action lawsuit by Afghan war veterans who say the federal government's 2006 change in benefits to wounded military violates their charter rights. You felt, and I'm sure you feel, there's a special obligation, a social contract for Ottawa to award men and women who fight for Canada. Wasn't that your understanding when you wore the uniform for more than 30 years? Well, it was, absolutely, and it, it, it doesn't, it normally is something that doesn't have to be written down or run through the courts. It's, it's an understanding between not only the government but the people of Canada. And I believe after World War I, it was a very, very strong time for, for emotions and and uh, Canada was just being born through the, uh, you know, the fire of the battlefield. And Robert Borden's words were, were proper in the context of the beginning of the country, and they, sh- they should be just as proper today. In, uh, and Bruce, as far as you're concerned, you put on the uniform, you went to Afghanistan, you fought, you were in that terrible battle where you and most of the members of your platoon, uh, well, most of you lost most of the, your fellow members of your platoon. Did you have a sense, did you have a feeling that there was a, a special arrangement that the, that the federal government was going to take care of the men and the women in uniform in a special way? Well, I, I definitely felt that uh, I wouldn't be going through what I'm going through now, uh, if I can tell you that. And uh, if, if I may say, uh, being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, uh, I can say truthfully that I would say 50% of my problems result from my time in Afghanistan and 50% of the problems result from uh, the lack of support I've gotten when I got home. Remind us of what happened to you in Afghanistan. Well, uh, I was... I was hit in a friendly fire incident uh, the day after the Battle of Panjway. And the Battle of Panjway was essentially uh, the biggest Canadian-led battle since Korea. And what happened was we, uh, my company, uh, two platoons worth of us, uh, were ambushed by over uh, 400 Taliban, dug-in f- Taliban fighters. And we had a five-hour firefight in which we were forced to retreat. The next morning, we were to go back into uh, the, uh, the battle to take the infamous white school when a A-10 warthog... Uh, up in the sky, uh, got a mixed uh, signals with the Canadians on the ground and uh, accidentally strafed our uh, our platoon. So essentially, my platoon of 40 men was reduced to five in a matter of uh, of two uh, two out two days. And this A-10 warthog, just reading your piece that you wrote, Canada, I fought for you and you let me down. This A-10 warthog fires 180 rounds a second, and the shells or the bullets or what whatever you want to call them. Uh, are th- are the size of a man's forearm? You wrote. Yes, sir. They're, they're uh, uranium-based, highly uh, highly explosive, and uh, the, the the gun is so powerful that it pushes the jet back in uh, midair. Tell us about your well, injuries. I, I think that thing is listed as a cannon, not a gun. It's it's massive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really big. <laughs> That's right. Sorry about that. It, it is a cannon, and I've got it sitting right in front of me. Not the gun, not the cannon, but the the description of it. Uh, Bruce, remind us of the of the injuries that you suffered. Um, well, I was hit by shrapnel in the brain, uh, the head, and uh, or the yeah, in the head, in the the back, in the buttocks, and uh, I had to have five percent of my brain removed. And I was flown to uh, Afghanistan, Camp Nathan Smith, and Kandahar, where I underwent my first brain surgery, and then the second brain uh, brain surgery I had in Lancashire, Germany, and I was flown home and I had to undergo extensive uh, physical and occupational therapy. So this, uh, Barry, is at some point here where Bruce is back in Canada. He would likely be accessing or should be accessing or should have the right to access JPSU, which would be tasked to look after him properly, correct? Uh, that, that's correct. That, so, I mean, that's the entire intent of the, uh, the unit. And once again, I'm, I'm here in Nova Scotia with uh, a military couple who uh, have been failed by that unit, and I'm, I'm trying to help out a uh, serving private right now. Let's get into that in a little bit. Uh, so I'd like to know what's happening to that couple. Uh, we hear the individual stories. Bruce, when, when, you, when you came home and you looked at what was available to you, what federal government would do for you, what was available through Veterans Affairs, they cut you a check for $22,000, right? That's right, sir. What explanation came with that? None. I, uh, I essentially received a check in the mail, and without any explanation whatsoever, 
I had to ask people what it was for. Uh, and then they told me that it was uh, my, my lump sum payment. I honestly thought it was a joke or something. Like I thought, you know, it was maybe danger pay or uh, some sort of my pension or something along the lines of that. I couldn't possibly fathom that 5% of my brain would garner me a uh, 5% uh, or a 10% uh, pension. And from which I've been pretty much uh, fighting the, uh, that for the last seven and a half years now. I'm going to read from uh, from your piece that you wrote in your, your article. Um, my injury remains listed at 10%. For some reason, I received $22,000 rather than $25,000, which is 20, 10% of $250,000. I don't understand the math Veterans Affairs uses. When I got my original settlement in 2008, I was given a check. No explanation, no breakdown, just a check. $22,000 was all I got. A slap to the face. 10% of the money to retire on. In comparison, there are clerks in the military, those who sit behind a desk doing paperwork, who receive 13% of the $250,000 for the carpal tunnel syndrome in their wrists. So you have the clerks receiving 13% for carpal tunnel. You get shot up by an A-10, lose 5% of your brain, almost lose your life, and they give you less than that. Yeah, no, it, uh, the old system uh, was, and, and that clerk, uh, she is getting a monthly paycheck uh, under the old system, whereas I get uh, my lump sum uh, just once. And then uh, if, uh, if I appeal, so say seven and a half years later, my appeal will, will, if I do get that, say, tomorrow, what will happen is I don't get any interest or any, uh, any like, uh, uh, compound interest for the seven years that I didn't get my money. So essentially, like, this is supposed to be put away for my retirement, but I'm, I'm essentially seven and a half years behind on my retirement uh, for this money to, to do anything for my retirement. We'll take a break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk more to Sergeant Major Barry Westholm and uh, uh, former Canadian Forces Soldier Bruce Moncour about their experiences and their sense of what sort of responsibility, what responsibility the federal government has to the men and women in uniform. And you'll hear more about what happened to Bruce Moncourt, and you'll hear more about why Sergeant Major Barry Westholm left the JPSU, and you'll hear about that couple in Halifax. Remember, lawyers, federal government lawyers, argued in court earlier this year that the federal government has no special obligation to the men and women in uniform who fight wars in Canada. And the commitment made by Sir Robert Borden in 1917, those lawyers said, just a political speech. Just a political speech. We'll come right back. You can follow me on Twitter at The Roy Green Show. Emails to Roy at RoyGreenShow.com. With me are Sergeant Major Barry Westholm, retired, and Bruce Moncour, who is also a former now member of Canada's military. And as you've heard, he suffered horrifying injuries, uh, wounds from that uh, being fired on by that A-10 uh, warthog uh, tank killer personnel killer plane from its cannon there there's so much that uh, that we that we have to cover with uh, with my guests and and we're going to do that uh barry and uh, bruce i just want to read you something that i received from somebody in the military and i've spoken with this uh with this person on, on a number of occasions and this is a whistleblower email and he's asked clearly i'm not going to identify who this individual is but uh, i saw this um Bottom line is, more than two years ago, the military leadership had been told that a storm of PTSD was coming. They simply did not know how to deal with it. These are career officers with more operations staff than combat or personnel experience. It is simply something they were not capable of comprehending. The JPSUs had chronically been understaffed because operations, not personnel, took precedence. Until the last 10 months, I would say, admission of PTSD was a career death sentence. Many of those who admitted to it had less than 10 years, and would simply be medically forced out. Barry, is this person correct or incorrect? Well, here, here's the deal. I, I've had PTSD. I had PTSD since I was a Master Corporal, which is a junior rank, and I had PTSD up until I was a Master Warrant Officer, which is a very senior rank. So for anybody that's in the military now that's listening, and they do have PTSD, the bottom line is to go get help. Um, and you can have Where? a successful career. I did. Uh, Where do you get the help? Well, you, you, you personally you have to step forward, and it, it's got to be a, uh, a holistic thing where everybody's in it together. It can't be, oh, yeah, you have to go report. No, it's, it's a budget. It's teamwork. It's done at the private, the private level, 
and right up where everybody understands the injury and they can bring it out of the shadows so it can be treated and people can get well. Is the, uh, is the methodology in place, is the, is the system in place in Canada's military, and we're talking JPSU here, is it, is well, it sufficiently capable, staffed, sufficiently staffed, to do what you just suggested needs to be well, done? Well, not at all, and that's, again, why I'm a civilian now. And the, the girl that I'm with right now, a private, she's actually got PTSD from the way she was treated while in the JPSU. So you can't get any backwards or more backwards than that. Bruce, when you looked for help, what did you get? Well, first of all, I tried to go actually a different route. I tried to do it where I didn't have to report it. I tried to get the help uh, through paying for therapy on my own and tried to do it so I, I wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be brought to the attention of uh, the hires. And then when I realized that I couldn't do that, that was when I was released. And then uh, I, I was able to get a, a case file, actually a case manager, when she read about me in the paper, actually. Uh, and she personally uh, uh, took me on as a, as a case because uh, she knew I needed help. So it wasn't through somebody appointing me a case manager. It was just a really uh, amazing person that just read my story and took it upon herself to uh, take me on. That was one person? Yes. Sir. Not the system? No. If I read from your Canada I fought for you, and you let me down, peace. Um, I see that you wrote in 2010, I decided to contact the military ombudsman who told me that there was nothing he could do and that I should contact Veterans Affairs. You're right, I did just that. And again, I said that I wanted to appeal my decision, the $22,000 they gave you. They said that I could choose from a list of military-approved legal representation, but my lawyer would not be covered because they didn't want to pay the gas mileage for him to travel to and from London, Ontario. Furthermore, they said that they would contact me with the date and time for my appeal, but nothing happened. When I called back, Veterans Affairs produced more excuses, saying they had no idea I wanted an appeal or that my file was being held because I had not signed a release. In essence, I felt I was getting the runaround. It was incompetence on a level of criminal negligence. My aunt says it best, as a small business owner, if I ran a company like that, like the military, I'd be in jail. Those are your words. Yeah, that's true. And all of it's true. Your life today, um, lots of things you can't do. Yeah. yeah you you have short-term memory that. issues? Uh, the memory issue. Well, I, I, I forget very easily. I have to write things down. The fatigue. Uh, I said in that piece, um, climbing a mountain is not a problem for me. Reading a book about climbing a mountain is a problem for me. And those are the types of, the, of things that they don't really take in consideration. If I look like I can you know, run a marathon or if I look physically fine, there's nothing wrong with me. They don't, they don't think that uh, the, like, you know, the, 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 the brain is uh, a, a very fickle organ and they don't, they're not taking it to a next level. Okay, hold on, Bruce. Hold on, Bruce. And Barry, hold on as well. Please, Sergeant Major Barry West home. We're going to take a break. I want to give you my phone number. 1-877-399-9898 is the number for you to call. 1-877-399-9898. You have a story you want to share? You have a story you need to tell? Call me. 1-877-399-9898. We'll come right back. You know, we had uh, heard, we'd heard that federal lawyers had said the... uh, Government of Canada has no special obligation to the men and women in uniform. We'd heard that. But on Tuesday of this week, just as the Prime Minister of Canada was welcoming back the final contingent of Canadian soldiers from Afghanistan, we became officially aware, Canadian press got the uh, got the uh, information of what the lawyers had said in court in January. And we now know that the court, <laughs> federal lawyers argued now, the government of Canada has no special obligation to Canada's men and women in uniform. None. Zero. None. Zero. And then what Sir Robert Borden said in 1917 about this nation having a special obligation and a special duty, that was just a political speech. Uh, if you send your son or daughter to war, do you think the federal government has responsibility to your son or daughter? You know, special responsibility. We're hearing from uh, Sergeant Major Barry Westholm and uh, Bruce Moncor. Bruce, uh, you were a corporal, right? Yes, sir. Uh, Corporal Bruce Moncor uh, fought in Afghanistan and suffered those horrendous injuries. Horrendous injuries. 
and got the bureaucratic runaround. Got a check for 22000 bucks. Not even 10% of what he would have gotten had he, uh, had he lost an arm or a leg. Just a check for $22,000. No explanation, nothing. Here's your check for 22000 and then the bureaucratic runaround. He goes on to write in his piece, Canada, I fought for you and you let me down. I was devastated, but it was only August 12, 2013, that's last year, folks, that I reached my final level of exasperation. I received a phone call from a woman working on my case asking me about what I was appealing. When did you start the appeal, Bruce? Uh, as soon as I was injured, uh, pretty much uh, uh, September of, uh, of uh, 2006. 2006, right? Yes, sir. So August 12, 2013, Bruce writes, I reached my final level of exasperation. I received a phone call from a woman working on my case asking me about what I was appealing. She explained that Veterans Affairs had classified my injury under Table 20.58 for soldiers suffering from Headaches. Not penetrating head injuries, but headaches. A soldier with afflicted with chronic migraines is in the same category as I am. The woman informed me that I am the second highest level in nine and that she could move my pension up by one level to a 13, which is the highest it can go and would increase my pension by another 5%. Apparently to Veterans Affairs, getting shot in the head in Afghanistan is the same as working in an office and suffering from headaches, a detail they've kept from me over the past seven years. Barry, doesn't that make you feel ill? Yes, and again, it, it's, when they start putting policy over people, they're not, they're, not, they're not thinking about the, you know, the empathetic side of the story, and they should be. It, it, it's all wrong. And that's where you've got to bring people into the equation to say, look at this, look what happened to the soldier, and then deal with the guy with respect and, you know, reimburse properly. But this year, we know that federal lawyers argued in court that the federal government has no special obligation to Canada's men and women in the military. So what level of uh, what level of commitment do you bring to taking care of the men and women in uniform if your lawyers are arguing in court that you don't have any special responsibility? Well, they, they shouldn't be, they're messing with semantics, too. When I read the article, I think it's on page 11, you'll see that they don't agree there's a social obligation in the context of the lawsuit. So... I don't know what they're doing. When you get lawyers involved, everything gets really complicated, and it should just be a statement by the government of what they what they uh, expect of the soldiers and what the soldiers should count on from the people of Canada. And I got to tell you, what this private that I'm dealing with here now, now tell us please about the private. Well, she uh, and it's sort of a something that's uh, totally different than what you see uh, normally with Afghanistan being in the forefront. She was doing her physical training in the morning. Uh, she was body checked by a, a larger man, a warrant. She's just a small uh, thing. And uh, basically, she got uh, her spinal cord was damaged severely, uh, mistreated. She was sent to the, uh, the medics, so she had to make her own way with this severe damage, which made it worse and worse and worse. And right now, she's got this thing called cauda equina syndrome. And basically, her lower half is just on fire 24-7. She's lost all function of her bowels, all functions of her bladder. Uh, she's bed uh, ridden for, for days at a time in, in agony. And she was left pretty much to her own devices out in her home. Uh, a soldier, a person in uniform, while she was in the military, never came, made it out to see her in two years. Nobody and came to see her for two years? In uniform. In so uniform. Like her chain of command, the people that are responsible for her, didn't make it out to see her in that condition in two years. And she was in the GPSU. And you're in Halifax. Well, I'm in Halifax now sorting this whole thing out. For no, you don't live in Halifax, but you're there to no. help her. Which is what no, the government, well, which is what the military should be doing, or the government through the military should be doing. Every time I sit beside her and she vents a lot about the, the, the frustration she's gone through, she'll vent for hours. And I'll, I'll always tell her, I said, the reason you're in the situation you're in is because there wasn't a guy in uniform sitting beside you, talking with you from the first day that you were injured and in the GPSU. She's never had that. Never. Bruce, have you had that? Have you had anybody in uniform sit beside you and, and, and express concern and compassion and caring for you? Um, well, I could tell you, we could tell you hundreds of stories about hundreds of sto- soldiers that have fallen between the cracks. And, uh, myself, I've had some, I've had some really good soldiers like, uh, like Sergeant Major, Major Westholm. He's a good soldier. There was a good soldier. And there's, there are some people that care, but, uh, you'd have to be lucky enough to, in your career to cross paths with them at that moment. And I was fortunate enough to have somebody, uh, uh, a sergeant that helped me. 
uh, when I was injured. But I could, I, I, I can tell you another few stories in the, along the same terms that that young lady's gone through. Yeah, and we know that you uh, you were classified as having headaches when you lost five percent right. of your brain in that terrible conflict. Mike is calling from Vancouver. Hi, Mike. Hey, uh, I'm a I'm a veteran myself. I uh, was got out in '05, so I never got to go to Afghanistan or anything like that. Uh, I wrote a piece for the Georgia Strait a little while ago about why we should support our veterans, and basically I broke it down like this: We are as uh, society elect a government. When we elect a government, the gov- we say to the government, you're going to do stuff with our money, and you're going to do stuff on our behalf, and you know we trust you to do that. So the government sends our boys off to war. We, the people, want them taken care of when they come back. We, the people, probably didn't even understand this war was going to happen. Most people who supported Afghanistan, I guarantee you, could not have found it on a map in 2001. Guarantee you, I could, like 90% of people out there, I guarantee they didn't even know where it was. But we still, we trust our government. We trust them. Send them to war. They come back, what happens? They get completely screwed over. We, as a society, don't want that. And yet our government just screws over our veterans. And it, oh, it makes me absolutely sick. And I am so glad, Roy, that you are actually keep this issue alive. Because if, if it wasn't for guys like you, it would fade away. It would disappear. Like... I can't. It cannot. It, it cannot exactly. disappear, Mike. It cannot. And we have the Veterans Affairs Minister, Julian Fantino, who's not very happy with me because of an interview I did with him a couple of months ago. And I had a lot of respect for Mr. Fantino. I've known him for many years. I knew him as a cop um, when he was a cop. But he said, uh, some uh, argues, quote, some have called the work done by Veterans Affairs to be a duty, a responsibility, a commitment, a social contract, or a sacred, sacred obligation. I believe it is all of those things, end quote. That's what he said earlier this week. And during the same week, we find out that government lawyers argue the federal government has no special responsibility to, uh, to, to men and women in the military. And they, they'll drag in this class action lawsuit, but that's a smokescreen. The overall issue is what you said, Mike, and that is... We take care of the men and women in uniform so that we don't have Barry Westholm, Sergeant Major Westholm, talking to us about this female private. We don't have uh, Corporal Bruce Moncur uh, explaining what he what he explained to us. We don't hear about a, 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 a 20-year veteran of Canada's armed forces who committed suicide last Christmas Day when she drove her car into the front of a, of a, of a uh, semi-trailer truck. And her husband receives a letter from Veterans Affairs a few weeks later saying, we overpaid, uh, we sent you a full check for the month of December, I'm paraphrasing, for, for her support. But since she died before the end of the month, we want some of the money back. That happened. Mike, I thank you for the call, sir. Thank you. Barry, what's the what are the prospects for the uh, for the young woman? She's former soldier or still in the military now? Oh, she's, she's still in the military right now. Uh, the, the big thing is uh, to get her healthy because she is she's really disintegrated now. She's well. Who's looking yeah. after her? You are. I'm looking after her. I'm That's it. You, you're it. I'm at, I, I, I'm should, well, wait a minute. If she's still, Barry, if she's still a member of the military, yeah, she still has a rank in the military. Yeah, she has. She's has she been diagnosed with PTSD? Have her physical her physical issues been diagnosed? Well, again, because she's been so uh, left to her own devices, everything now is back on the on the table. We're bringing her back in to get reassessed. We're bringing her back to Veterans Affairs to get make sure she's getting the right things. After two years, the house, house modifications have been installed for two years. After two years. You know, yeah, and she's been using a commode, basically a toilet seat in a box. How old is she? She can't make it up the stairs. She's only 36. She's in the prime of her life. And this, this syndrome that she's got, I've read a lot about it, it's just absolutely brutal. You know, brutal. Let me take a, I, I have to take another break. We'll come back and we'll talk more with Corporal Bruce Moncour and Sergeant Major Barry Westholm. And you can call us at one eight seven seven three nine nine ninety eight ninety eight. 9898 Uh... Does Canada have a special obligation to its men and women in uniform who fight and are injured and are wounded? Do, do we have a special obligation to them? I, I would say to you that we have the obligation to give them whatever they need, whenever they need it. Whatever they need, whenever they need it. We'll come right back. We're on Twitter at The Roy Green Show. 
This is about uh, the men and women in uniform. And the federal government of Canada is lawyers saying there's no special obligation. The government has to uh, men and women in uniform? None. Zero. Forget about it. What was said in 1917 was then. That was just a political speech. We don't have any special obligations. I want you to know as well, and we'll be talking to uh, participants in this tomorrow, um, you will need to know about the True Patriot Love Expedition uh, team that is going to uh, be, it's, it's actually the largest expedition to the Magnetic North Pole in history. And it's going to take place, it'll start on the 21st of April of this year, to raise awareness of the physical and mental injuries that continue to impact Canadian soldiers, even though Canada's role in Afghanistan is diminishing. And it'll feature hockey legend Haley Wickenheiser. The team will be comprised of 24 corporate leaders and 12 injured soldiers who will depart from Resolute Bay on the 21st of April of this year. The expedition will be filmed by a documentary crew, and uh, they'll be producing a film that will air nationally. And here's the quote. The challenges that our men and women in uniform face on behalf of our country often do not end when they come home, end quote, says Tim Hodgson, co-chair of the expedition. Mr. Hodgson continues, the fact that we have on our team 12 injured soldiers speaks volumes not only to the need to support these men and women when they return from deployment, but also to their continued commitment to serve and their extraordinary determination to overcome their injuries. That's what they are. They're extraordinary people who do extraordinary things. And this uh, true love... True Patriot Love Expedition of the North Pole is going to be amazing, and we'll talk to two participants, uh, uh, a soldier, and uh, Mr. Paul Demare will join us as well. So that'll be tomorrow. We have a couple of minutes left with uh, Corporal Bruce Moncure and Sergeant Major Barry Westholm. May I read a few lines more from your, uh, from your uh, Canada I fought for you and you let me down, Bruce? Of course. This is, this is, this is what really got to me. Uh, I'm now at my wit's end, and this is what I want. No more conservative gestures, no more moral outrages from the public that last less than a week, and an end to watching 90-year-old men who fought in Dieppe, Normandy, and Korea, suffering through over 60 years of grief. My medals are in a sandwich bag at the bottom of my underwear drawer, and I now tell all prospective military recruits to explore all other options. The big green machine will eat you alive. I write this piece from the Mariana Trench because I've fallen so far between the cracks as one can possibly go, and I'm not an isolated case. There are hundreds of soldiers like me. I want my brains in a jar, and you can keep the comical pension you offer. I want to remember again. I want to write a little over five pages and not need a nap. I want dramatic changes to the Veterans Affairs Office. There have been shining lights among all the bad. My family, friends, Colleen and Randy have all been there for me, and for that I say... I give up. I'm waving the white flag, beaten, battered, and heartbroken. Canada, I fought for you and you let me down. There's nothing more I can do. And now I need to put my focus on the people I love. Lesson learned. Hopefully I remember it. Maybe what a cry, man. <laughs> Seriously, uh, Bruce. Yeah, no, it, it, it was a very, uh, it was probably the, the lowest part of the, uh, the whole time that when I found out I was in that category for headaches. And I just sat down and wrote that piece because it was just, I didn't know what else to do. And I honestly, uh, and since then, it just, it, it's gained momentum, this, this uh, veterans, uh, how we're being treated. Um, I, I had a meeting with uh, Aaron O'Toole and Jeff Watson uh, on Thursday, and I met a gentleman. He, he fought in the Devil's Brigade. He was, uh, he's in his 90s. And he's part of the first special forces, and he he uh, he got shot in 1944. And he said to us that he's been fighting for his pension and fighting for his you know the services since 1946. And now, the Veterans Affairs says I gave him an appointment to meet him in meet them in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, but aren't going to pay for him to get there. So he has to pay his own way to Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island to try to get his pension sorted out 70 years in the, in the making. Good Lord. Yeah. Barry? You know, um, I went to the Vimy Memorial, and uh, France gave the land in, in that area under the memorial to Canada in perpetuity forever. And that's actually a part of Canada. And I think they've got the right attitude about showing respect and appreciation for what Canadians have done on behalf of, of, of strangers, complete strangers. And I think Canada's got to take the same tack. 
and that government should hear the voices of the people, and those people should be loud and clear about what they want for their veterans. All right, let's talk to one of those people. We have about a minute and a half left. Martina in uh, B.C. Yes, hi. It's, um, I'm just phoning. It may be a very simplified thought process, but I, I'm just thinking of the soldiers that enter into the military with the, with the intent to defend uh, their country um, at the risk of their lives or a serious injury. I don't understand why the um, why the country would not think it's their responsibility to look after them if they get seriously injured or special responsibility is what they said. Martina, thank you very much for the call. I think that mirrors uh, the, the the sentiment and the emotion of the the majority of Canadians. We uh, we feel that there is a responsibility to the men and women in uniform. Uh, and women. you know, if you don't, if you don't, why do you why do you attend Remembrance Day ceremonies if you don't think there's a special responsibility, uh, well, gentlemen, guys? Know. Sorry, Barry, have about 10 seconds. Go ahead, please. Yeah, when a, when a recruit joins up, he has to take the same oath to Canada as a Supreme Court justice. Just goes to show you what they expect from a 17-year-old. Yeah. Sergeant Mary, Major Barry Westholm, thank you, Barry, for everything you do. Thanks for and having Cor- me on there. And Corporal Bruce Moncourt, Bruce, you're a brave man. You've suffered uh, a tremendous amount, and you deserve far more than you've gotten. You've earned far more than you've gotten. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. All the best. Bye. Um, We'll come back. Stay with us. We also believe very strongly that over the last few years, our men and women serving in Afghanistan have once again proven themselves to be highly skilled, disciplined, and courageous. They have provided security for our aid workers, our diplomats and reconstruction teams who have made progress, have made substantial progress in restoring infrastructure, training the Afghan forces, and making life safer and better for the Afghan people. We should be proud, we should be very proud of our contributions and accomplishments in Afghanistan. We are making a real positive difference there. And we are demonstrating to our enemies and to our allies that Canada is a reliable and resolute partner in the quest for global security and the fight against terrorism. 